friend of the show is back in town. Uh, Paul Stone is with us. He's the co-founder and CEO of Colonial Metals Group, who I am actually investing with because I'm putting my money in gold, baby. There's a big crash coming. It's coming. It's coming, baby. And I recommend, I'm telling everybody, uh, take your money out of the stock market, put your money into precious metals. Uh, anyway, and lots of people have told me that too, by the way. Not just, this isn't just coming from Jimmy. This isn't just coming from Paul. It's coming from all kinds of people I've talked to. Um, who's the Bitcoin guy that, um, Max? Max, Max, uh, Kaiser. Kaiser. I've talked Ed Dowd, who was a famous, uh, hedge fund guy from, New, from, uh, Wall Street. So plenty of people have said, do what I'm doing. So I'm doing it. But anyway, here is Paul Stone. He's the co-founder and CEO of Colonial Metals Group, a Florida-based precious metal supplier that helps clients develop secure retirement plans by investing in gold and silver. His writings appear at Substack at thepaulstone.substack.com. Welcome back to the show, Paul. Good to see you. Oh, it's so good to be back. Thanks. So, Great to see you. So I saw this show, this article and I was like, well, I know the guy to bring in to talk about this. <laughs> and this is the article. So I saw this throughout Yahoo News. It says, gold rallies amid a perfect storm, expectations <clears throat> that the Fed will cut rates. And this is by N.S. Ferry. N.S. Ferry. Okay, here, here we go. So let me, it says, gold hit new highs on Tuesday as investors continue to bet that major central banks will start cutting interest rates this year. On Tuesday, morning gold futures reached a high of $2,150.50 after April contracts settled at a record $2,126. Per ounce in the prior session, Tuesday's intraday spot gold touched a record of two thousand one. So let me let me ask you. Uh, by the way, let me just put. Let me do this, and then we'll ask you. The precious metal is considered a safe haven during times of geopolitical tensions and when interest interest rates decrease. While the timing of the first Fed rate cut is uncertain, investors expect that the Federal Reserve to begin cutting rates in June. While so. Let me, um, oh, and one more. Central banks have been buying up gold at historic levels. <clears throat> the banks are buying gold at historic levels. Huh. And so let me bring Paul in. You're the gold guy. My question is, why does gold go, explain to me why gold goes up when they start to cut interest rates? What is that? How do you know why that is? Yeah, yeah, I mean, at the surface, it's a bit confusing, right? You would think, yeah. oh, well, if they're going to make economic action flow easier by making the bar the cost of borrowing money cheaper, then wouldn't that strengthen things? Right. Um, it's highly abnormal to have interest rates during the Obama time at zero. I mean, eight years. Whenever the Fed cut rates in the face, or once a recession began, when you look back at the charts. Uh, it wasn't very long that the rates were low. They usually turned right around and started raising them higher as economic activity improved. So to have interest rates at zero for a long time is a bad sign. When we ought to have rates at, uh, you know, the average over the last maybe 50 years is somewhere around 6%. That's mm -hmm. average. And if we're at 2%, that's not average, not normal. And in the face of normalizing rates to be around 4 5 6%, suddenly they have to reverse strategy and make borrowing the dollar practically free again. That's got to be a sign of some horrific situation oh, around the corner. Okay. Because flooding, it's kind of like if you're stuck in the mud in your car or your truck or the snow, What do you, your options are to floor it. Right. So you just floor it. The federal government's just the Federal Reserve's hitting the gas pedal when they drop rates to zero. They're just flooding the economy, oh. the global economy, with as much dollar action as they can create. So a stronger so you're saying that a stronger economy could withstand a mm -hmm. reasonable interest rate. Absolutely. An uh, an altruistic, healthy, wholesome economy with real fundamentals to it, yes. And and so you're also saying that uh we're the opposite of that. We don't have whole, uh, healthy fundamentals in our economy right now. A trillion every hundred days. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get yeah, to that we'll get story to that next. Uh -huh. But so you're saying, so, so but they're still still they're still printing money, and money doesn't really have uh, taxes don't have much to do with what they spend. Um, so so banks. So banks are buying up gold. So what does that tell you? <clears throat> well, it's always told me the same thing it's always said. It's just like J.P. Morgan said, who was the father of perhaps creating one of the biggest financial enterprises on the planet, J.P. Morgan. He said, 
Gold is money. Everything else is credit. So credit is like a promise. It's something you write on paper. Money was always gold and silver until 52 years ago. So all throughout human history, gold and silver was money. Now we can make money from a tree. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not money. So when you look at um, what the choices are for a government to finance itself, it's either live within its means and, and deal with whatever tax revenue they create, right? In the old days, uh, you know, they'd be raising taxes if the government needed to pay some bills it didn't have the money for. These days, they just print the money, as you were talking about fiat earlier. Fiat currency. Right, fiat currency. So around the world, money has always been gold and silver until 52 years ago when Nixon ended the relationship. And so you, you have a great stat that what was the dollar worth then and what is it actually worth now, <clears throat> Right. So I like to make the analogy that perhaps paper money, when we figured out how to make it mostly from linen, it's a secret recipe, was a better <laughs> way to carry gold and silver. Right. Right. It folds up. It's uh, if something bad happens to a bill, they can just replace it. If something bad, you know, if a coin gets all dinged up, they have to melt it down and remake it. Um, so even when we use paper as money, gold backed that 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 paper money. And um, uh, when you look at severing that relationship the government then doesn't have to live within its tax revenue anymore. And that's what we see, this, this daycare, running the daycare. Like if you ever watch C-SPAN, it doesn't have any volume. It's like watching a daycare. It's just people are wearing suits and, and fancy dresses. And uh, they're making choices for themselves without having to check in with the parents, check in with reality. When the government has to live within tax revenue, it has to consult with reality. When they can just print all the money they want for the last 52 years, they create their own reality. And none of us out here are liking what we're seeing. And so you, they, they, they're they saying, so here's what, one more thing I want to ask you about. It says bullion's price increases, meaning gold bullion, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, So gold bullion, that's like a gold bar? Is that what bullion is? So technically there's like four food groups, if you will. There's uh, real estate, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Uh, bullion and you know things, other things that you could just invest in non-financial things. So everything under the blanket of bullion. And then you can get into coins that are worth more than their weight or bars that are only ever worth their weight. So okay. within that category, everything's gold and silver and bullion. Okay. So it says bullion's price increases have been disconnected from recent outflows seen in gold-related ETFs. What does that mean? You know, to me, and again, what we're doing is following breadcrumbs, right? We're thinking, well, what does this mean? It, there must be an action that's happening. We may not see where the fire is burning, but we can see the smoke in the sky. And so to me, that says that there's a flight from virtual gold and silver. Owning gold and silver in your phone is not ounces in a safe in your house or in a depository. So it could very well be that um, funds are flowing from the digital dollar financial world into the physical gold and silver world. Okay. So you could see an outflow of, you know, what causes money to move? It's either fear or greed, basically. Right, right. Okay. So and then it says, strategists believe investors have been rotating money into <clears throat> Bitcoin ETFs as the token has roared toward new highs. But now we're going to do a story in a minute that it's actually crashed again, Bitcoin. So, but now I don't know crash, but it's great. It certainly yeah. went down. Mm -hmm. Profit taking, perhaps. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And so now... Here's now I saw this. Actually, a friend of mine sent me this. And this again, everything I keep seeing just keeps reinforcing my decision mm -hmm. to put my retirement into into metals, mm -hmm. into gold. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, my whole thing was I didn't want to get rich on my retirement. That I I just want to make I didn't want to wake up like those people in two thousand eight and their right. retirement savings were gone their four hundred one ks were nothing right right and then you had to hope that the government did some chicanery which is exactly what they did mm -hmm. and just printed money but now we're it seems like we're at the end of that cycle and I've talked about a million reasons why we we might be at the end of that one of them is that uh, the petrodollar is going away mm -hmm. and they're starting uh, Saudi Arabia selling oil and other denominations mm -hmm. beside American dollar. That's right. one of the things, but mm -hmm. there's also economic power centers like BRICS that are being uh, created to oppose the, the, the Western hegemony and the, and the greenback, the American back. And so here's one more reason 
So somebody sent me this. Now, I don't know if I, did I send you this? It says, so this woman, Ann, Ann, Ann Vandersteel, tweeted this out. She says, banking collapse imminent. And the reset has begun. Effective March 26, 2020, the Federal Reserve Board re re reduced reserve requirement ratios on all net transaction accounts to 0%, eliminating reserve requirements for all depository institutions. Now, that doesn't sound good. Uh, it's it's and the then, same thing as cutting rates. And then, in, and so that's the same thing. So they had to cut rates because the banking it's, industry wasn't healthy. It, it release all the money you can. Okay, so that's just flood. Okay. And then in the spring of 2023, she tweets out, the banking collapse started with smaller regional banks, which we saw <clears> that happen. And then in the spring of 2024, the next wave of banking collapse will continue. And then in uh, November 2020, the CEO of the Bank of America, Wells Fargo and JP, oh, what, where's the rest of that? Oh, anyway, so... Do you, so I just have this spidey sense <laughs> that I've had that yeah. there's no way this is going to be sustainable. And now <clears> that they're cutting rates, that's a that's a bad sign. Now, a lot of people would think that's that's a bad sign. That's why banks are buying gold. And so you think there's there were you think that we're in, headed for another banking collapse? Well, when you look at history. Um, when, when something needs an airline, right? If it needs money from outside the ticket sales and what, how the airline generally generates mm -hmm. money, right? It ends up in bankruptcy court Yeah, and it needs a cash infusion from outside of itself. So if the government is creating debt, it means it doesn't have enough money to pay the pill, the bills, the economy is costing. Right. So they, when they print money, they're bringing money in from an external source, if you will. Right. Same thing here. Um, and you know, I could send you the, uh, you know, the links to this research right off right out of the Fed's website um, where they host data like this, that they decided to to reduce bank reserves from 20 percent or so to zero. So that if you were holding 20, you know, 20 billion dollars in reserves, you now had 20 billion dollars you could use to shore up your financial institution. And I make no financial projections or I'm giving financial advice and I'm not. Uh, you know, an expert in the way that uh, I've been trained to understand the man-made financial system in its entirety. But what I am, hopefully, is for folks to understand taking very complicated discussions like these and flatten them out onto the kitchen table and making them very simple. If, if I needed to borrow $11 million a year, right, to keep my business going, what there's no point to me being in business. It's a falsehood. I don't have any cost customers. There's no reason for me to do what I do because I'm, what I'm doing is a failure. If the government needs money from outside of itself by printing money from the Federal Reserve, it's a failure. If a financial firm, an airline needs external sources of money continuously, not just for the month of March, if you will, right. uh, then that says to me that that thing is not viable. It's not really alive, living under its own might. Okay. All right. Um, uh, you know, we just found out that the former prime minister of the UK uh, said in an interview uh, that when she became prime minister, she realized that she didn't run things, that the people who ran things were the bankers and that the head of the, uh, in, the, the bank in England could not be fired, but she could be. Oh, yeah. And that's when she realized, oh, my God, we're not really in control here. That's what that's according to the former prime minister of the UK. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, that's the exact same situation. You know, Barack Obama, uh, when he was running for president, it got revealed. Citibank, after he won the presidency, Citibank sent an email to him and his campaign and they had a list of all the people they wanted in his cabinet cabinet. Every one of those people on that list made it into his cabinet. Yeah. And that's who you know who's really running the government. That's why it's a joke to think that the people in Congress or Joe Biden and the, his neocons surrounding him, the warmongering maniacs, right. are actually making these decisions. They're they're getting orders. Yeah, They're being ordered by the billionaire class who actually doesn't give a shit about this country. They don't care about citizens or voters or anything. And they have an agenda. And... Right now, their agenda is to prop up this banking system any way possible. <clears throat> but at the same time, they're screwing us um, overseas. And that's why the rest of the world, you know, we started to use our fiat currency. 
as we weaponized it against people with yeah. our sanctions, <laughs> right? So our foreign policy is all about sanctioning people, <clears throat> sanctioning people, and we can do that because everybody had to hold American dollars and trade in American dollars. Well, now people, and that was a big part of why Gaddafi, they took him down because he wanted to create a currency just for Africa, and they can't have that because then we can't control <clears throat> them. Right. And so... But uh, so these the international billionaire class are do are being such um, reckless actors, and so um, you know they're weaponizing the dollar so much that people are going away from the dollar, yeah, and that's going to screw our whole economy up, and that's going to crash our. And so you know the same people who did it in two thousand eight are the same people in charge now, and they're going to do it again. That's why. That's why I feel. I agree. I mean, that's what that's what following the breadcrumbs, keeping it simple for simple folks that don't have, you know, six degrees in economy in economics. Um, every action has a reaction. Right. Um, if if you if you're literally going to make the choice to turn your current your nation's currency into toilet paper, you have no interest in protecting or defending the rights of the citizens that live within the land. Right. You literally have no damn to care. It's unbelievable. And so here we are, you know, I've said before on the show, uh, when I look around and, and do research, I'm finding that the dollar is worth somewhere between four and 2.7 cents. Backed by gold, it was worth 100 cents. In the year 2000, it was worth 56 cents. So the decision making of Washington and then those that are in alignment with Washington holding the purse strings to financial campaigns or influence or what have you, Wall Street uh, have been making this choice that enrichment in America comes from destroying the dollar. And that journey's just about over. And that journey, it seems like it. Yeah. It really does. Really quick question, Paul. Okay, it might be silly, <clears throat> but my question is, okay, so let's say I have gold. Uh -huh. Okay, where do I spend it? Yeah, I get this question all the time. And there are no silly questions. Because every, you know, how many questions do you answer for yourself before you go buy another car or get a different house, right? You answer all the questions before you say yes. So everyone has to have these questions answered before they can say yes to something or fully, you know, feel comfortable understanding it. So uh, one example would be if all of a sudden the electrical grid was over, how would you pay for stuff? And no major, you know, big box stores would never probably be able to pivot to taking gold and silver. But something would rise up in its place locally, the local farm stand. No, you're not probably going to be able to pay for gas at the gas station with precious metals. The world would change, right? There isn't an answer to every question in the way that what situation could we be in and how will it go? But economic activity is always driven by hunger. It's the one thing we can't solve. I could eat 50 pounds of food today and throw up all night and I'd still be hungry tomorrow. So I'm either going to buy that food with something, I'm going to create work, that creates money for me and pay the farmer for food or the farmer's gonna grow it. So when we say, what can I use gold and silver for? I can't buy, I can't go shopping at Walmart with stock in Walmart, right? And I can't guard my home with stock in Smith & Wesson. But gold and silver is a store of value. And as long as there's always some kind of currency in this country, likely there would be, then I'm gonna liquidate my precious metals into that currency and go about my day. But in the time leading up to 1971, or I guess, you know, many, a few decades before that, you went shopping up until 1933, to be correct, with gold and silver or the cash. So th this is the abnormal period of human existence where paper or something electronic is the representation of money. Um, if you live in a time where everything ends and it's as ugly as it possibly could be, then gold and silver is money again, or hard work, right? Or other resources. You're getting so, your, your golden coins, I okay. Get, yes, so I'm getting my golden, I've been advised by other people besides Paul. Because you can't get, do a big bar. To get to, yeah, because yeah. what are you gonna do with a bar? So I'm gonna get it in, uh, in gold coins. The old saying is gold to buy the bakery and silver to buy the bread. Oh, look at that. Oh, okay, and it, that. what's the cheapest amount that I could buy gold for? Like, I, you know, like I, I'm well, a student or a struggling professional. I mean, what's like, the amount the of? The least amount. Well, the, the easiest entry point into, and, you know, there's different purposes for precious metals, right? There's, there's different reasons to own different versions of gold and silver, if you will. Um, 
So that answer has a couple different parts to it. But, you know, if you're looking up pricing online, you would see that a gold bar is usually the lowest entry point into owning an ounce of gold. It's just not only the it's not the only asset you'd want to own. And that's a great discussion that we have with clients one on one all the time. So I invite you to find us online or maybe there's a link below the screen. You know, give us a call. Look us up. Colonialmetalsgroup.com. And we'd love to have those one on one conversations because what we really want to end up doing is making sure whatever makes sense to you is what's in your portfolio. I put a lot of my money. I'm putting a lot of my money, my retirement money into precious metals, gold and silver. Why? Because lots of people I trust with money, uh, Max Kaiser's one of them, he's a big Bitcoin guy, and he told me gold is a good hedge against inflation, and gold is a good hedge against the stock market, and so did um, Carol Roth said that, and then also, who's the guy who wrote the book um, uh, from Maui, my friend? I, why am I blanking on his name? Ed. He, Ed Dowd. So they all said this, so I'm with them, and... Um, so I'm putting that into this, and I decided to partner with our sponsor to do this, Colonial Metals Group. They help, they're they helping me set up a secure self-directed IRA where I have access to my assets no matter what the stock market and no matter what the government's doing. So let a team of experts at Colonial Metals Group help you protect your family's future. We've put together a special offer for our audience. Get this offer. This, look, Listen to this. You click on the link in the description below or call a special 800 number and you'll receive a safe, a safe and up to $10,000 in free silver. Then the number to call is 888-910-1419, 888-910-1419 or go to colonialsmetalgroup.com slash Jimmy dash door dash show. Hey, come see us live on tour in Los Angeles, Palm Springs, Stockholm, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Berlin, Copenhagen, Oslo, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, Cortland, New York, Oakmont, Pennsylvania, right outside Pittsburgh, El Paso, and San Antonio, Texas. Go to JimmyDoor.com for a link for all those tickets. Mm -hmm.